I started thinking about how humans treat animals. Um, and I was fairly disturbed by this trip, and it got me uh, really considering if animals should be killed by humans for food. Uh, then I, I came across a book called Animal Liberation by Peter Singer, and he, just, he popularized the term speciesism in this book. The book came out in the mid-70s in the United States. And he said that speciesism is a lot like racism and sexism, in which people uh, who have the power uh, do not take the individuals that are not in their group, uh, do not give them the same moral consideration. Um, he says that speciesists species allow the interests of their own species to override the greater interests of members of other species. And I, um, I started thinking about this pretty hard and thought that that really resonated with me. Um, here are some things that speciesism has led to, keeping pigs in uh, cages so small they can't turn around for most of their lives, keeping egg-laying hens in cages so small they can't move or spread a wing, keeping chickens raised for meat in such crowded conditions with ammonia burning their lungs and sinuses. So, speciesism has ramifications that I did not like. And uh, so I founded a group called uh, Vegan Outreach uh, in 1993, co-founded it. And uh, 30 years later, my hair is gone, but um, here's uh, the organization's website. And what we do is uh, <clears throat> promote a vegan diet and lifestyle on colleges across the country and also in Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, and Canada. And uh, soon after founding Vegan Outreach, I found that spreading a vegan lifestyle was very intertwined with the a subject of nutrition. And um, it's always, uh, it's not quite as simple as uh, at first it seemed in the early 90s when I started doing this, we felt as though a vegan diet is healthier than a, a meat-based diet. All we have to do is tell people about it. They're going to feel much healthier and it's problem solved. Well, it turned out to be a little more complicated than that. And uh, so I ended up writing a book with uh, Jenny Messina, who's another vegan RD, and called Vegan for Life. It started a few websites. So I wanted to talk today about uh, the research that's been done on Free living vegans. The vegan diet has been practiced since the mid 1940s in the Western world, um, and the rates of diseases of vegetarians, which would include lacto -ovo, ovo vegetarians and vegans, had started to be studied in the 1960s. Uh, it's studied. The vegan diet can be studied in two ways. One is clinical trials. These tend to be short term. They tend to be on people with advanced heart disease or. Uh, diabetes or people who are on that road. And um, to sum up that research very quickly, a, a whole food plant-based diet that's low in fat, low in sugar, can reduce your cholesterol levels and improve a lot of parameters of what's called metabolic disease, which is what starts when you start to um, move into the type 2 diabetes and heart disease. What I'm gonna talk more about today is observational studies on free living vegans. And um, these can be looked at in two ways. One is a cross-sectional study where you just look at people at one slice of time and you compare vegans to lactose vegetarians to people who eat only fish to meat eaters. Um, and then there's prospective cohorts where you actually follow people, where you get a group of people that do not have disease and you follow them over the next five to 15 or 20 years and see what diseases different people, different diet groups develop. So there's been six vegetarian cohorts. Um, four have been completed, the top four, and then the bottom two are still ongoing and we're still getting research out of them. The only two with a considerable number of vegans has been the bottom two uh, with about 2,000 in Epic Oxford and 5,500 in the Adventist Health 2 study. Epic Oxford is being done uh, mostly in the UK. The vegans in that study are mostly in the UK. And um, Adventist Health study Adventus 2 is being done on people in the United States who are part of the Seventh-day Adventist religion and they promote a vegetarian diet to their congregation. So it, um, and they also tend not to smoke and drink, so it's a, a good way to compare people uh, and see what difference the diet's making versus other lifestyle factors. 
So one of the first things that, uh, or I should say, the cross-sectional studies have shown uh, a big difference in body mass index. Body mass index is a, a measure of body weight in proportion to height. A healthy body mass index is considered to be between 20 and 25. Vegans tend to be right about in the middle at 22, and then meat eaters are on the higher, uh, are higher with 23.5 in this study. Um, that was from the UK. In the United States, the vegans are doing somewhat better than that compared to, or I should say the meat eaters are doing worse. So the meat eaters are above 25, which is considered overweight. Above 30 is considered obese. Um, and so the vegans, once again, in the Adventist Health Study 2, are right in the middle of the healthy range. Another thing to look at is cholesterol. Um, I took all the studies from 1980 to 2003 and averaged out the cholesterol levels of the vegans versus the meat eaters in these studies. I only chose studies where people were chosen uh, without uh, reference to what their cholesterol levels were or having heart disease, that sort of thing going in. So it should be somewhat of a good sample of the population of average vegans and average meat eaters. On average, the vegans had a to total cholesterol of 160 and meat eaters had a total cholesterol of 202. Now, LDL is the bad cholesterol, HDL is the good cholesterol, and if you see the, the differences uh, in these studies showed that vegans had a lower LDL, which is the bad, and also a slightly lower HDL, but the, the ratio of total cholesterol to HDL is what you want to be low, and the vegans were the lowest. And triglycerides in Western vegans, uh, vegans already also had the lowest levels of triglycerides. Blood pressure. Um, this has been studied in, in both Epic Oxford and Adventist Health Study also. Um, vegans had about health, half the rate of being diagnosed with high blood pressure as meat eaters did in Epic Oxford. And in the Adventist Health Study too, uh, vegans had about 75% less uh, risk of having high blood pressure. I want to say something real quick about the risk and confidence intervals because I'm going to bring them up a couple of times. Whenever you're comparing two groups, you're going to get, you're probably going to get a difference in the numbers. But what you need to find out is if it's statistically significant. And so uh, the numbers underneath the one are the, the risk. So semi-veg has 77% have of the risk as the meteors. And then if one is not in the confidence interval, then it means it's statistically significant. In other words, there's only a 5% chance that, th that it could be due to random chance. So since one is not in these confidence intervals, uh, and the vegan confidence interval is so small, then there's a very good chance that's not due to random chance. So there's a huge difference in vegan blood pressure uh, rates, risk compared to the meat eaters. Diabetes is another one where vegans have a huge advantage. So, if you look at this, vegans, uh, this was a two-year follow-up study where after two years, the vegans had 62% uh, less chance of being diagnosed with diabetes than the meat eaters. And this, uh, this finding was statistically significant. They adjusted for many other factors that you can see at the bottom, including body mass index. Um, type 2 diabetes is often associated with having a higher body weight, so you would think that, well, if vegans have a lower risk, it's probably due to our body weight. But they actually adjusted for that out, and it, it's, um, in this analysis, was due to other factors, so it's not exactly clear what they are. Cancer has been, um, cancer is hard to measure in populations of vegans because you need a whole lot of people in a, in a study to, to measure different cancer rates, especially of individual cancers. Uh, vegan diet, uh, I'm sorry, uh, vegan, if you look at general cancer, so all cancers combined, and you separate the vegans out from the semi-vegetarians and lacto ovo vegetarians and semi-vegetarians are people who eat meat uh, less than once a week, but uh, more than once a month, is generally the definition. So if you compare the vegans to the meat eaters, we have a, a reduced risk of cancer by about 19% in Epic Oxford. In Adventist Health Study 2, it was about the same. 
These findings were not highly statistically significant. As you can see, uh, 1.0 is almost in the confidence interval because of the 0.99. Uh, but because there was two studies with a very similar finding, I feel somewhat confident that vegans do have a lower risk of, of all cancers. There's been no cancers that can be compared. Um, the, the data has been all over the place, in other words, in, ter in terms of whether vegans have less of any individual type of cancer. Um, and what, most, most of the findings have been null, there's just been no difference with some findings that vegans have lower risk of certain cancers, but when you add it all up, the findings are not statistically significant. For heart disease, we actually don't have any studies that have looked at the rates of, vegan, of vegans getting heart disease. But we do have this study from Epic Oxford where the uh, combination of lacto-vegetarians and vegans had a lower risk, 31% uh, lower risk than the non-vegetarians. In terms of mortality, the Adventist Health Study uh, found that vegetarian women live two and a half years longer and vegetarian men live three years longer. There's been a meta-analysis of the four completed studies that I showed uh, on one of the first slides where I listed all the studies. And vegans had um, about the same, they had exactly the same risk of mortality in that study. There was only 60 eight vegan deaths, which is a very small amount to get to, to measure in a study like this. Um, so we really don't have a lot of info on, on uh, vegan mortality rates. And that was done a very long time ago before the vegan community really knew much about uh, vitamin B12, which I'm going to talk about a bit in a second. So now I'm going to talk about different nutrients and that vegans sh should be aware of or that people think vegans should be aware of. Um, I'm going to give some recommendations, and if you go to veganhealth.org, in the upper left is a uh, link to the recommendations I'm about to talk about. So if you're interested in them, there's no need to write them down right now. You can just go to that website, and where they're all in one easy place to find. So what is the, uh, if you're a vegan, what is your, the first question you hear from people? Very good. You've heard that before. Um, so plants do have protein. Here's quickly some foods to compare uh, for the total amounts of protein. A Burger King hamburger has 180 calories, 19 grams of protein. Uh, here's a Whole Foods vegan bean burrito. It took in comparison. It has less calories, a little bit uh, less protein also. Spaghetti has 330 calories, 12 grams of protein. But a tofurkey Italian sausage has 280 calories and a whopping 30 grams of protein. So those are just some foods. Okay, so can vegans get too little protein? Well, it's possible, and if it's all if all you eat is soda and can you guess? <laughs> Chips or French fries? Very good. This is a very smart group. Um, so, full-blown protein deficiency is known as kwashi worker. It's what people who are in countries where there's not enough food to eat get. It's a very devastating problem. Um, and vegans in the United States, no matter if, no one really eats nothing but soda and french fries. But if you're a vegan that tends towards soda and french fries, you're not going to get kwashi worker. Um, so, it is true that vegans are not going to get full-blown protein deficiency, but the question is, are we getting the ideal amounts of the various amino acids? Amino acids are the building blocks of protein. That's what's really important, not actually totally, total protein. So the way that uh, diets can be studied to see if someone's getting enough protein on them is to do a nitrogen balance study. Carbohydrates, alcohol, and fats do not have nitrogen. Only protein does, and that's somewhat of why protein is so important. Um, so what, what researchers do is they take people, they measure how much protein they're eating, and they measure whether they're losing nitrogen or gaining it, and then determine whether they're getting enough protein. Now, for all the, for all the discussion about whether vegan diets uh, provide enough protein or not, there's never been a nitrogen balance study on, on vegans. Um, so it's all somewhat theoretical. So the question is, do we get a complete protein? 
All plant foods, and what some of us don't know, possibly, is that we, they all have all the essential amino acids. It's a matter of what proportion they have them in. Um, and lysine is the limiting amino acid in vegan diets. That's the main one that most people need to even, if you think about protein at all, that's, that's the amino acid to be uh, concerned about, or, or maybe not even concerned, but just be aware of. And here are foods high in protein and lysine. There's quite a few of them in the vegan diet. So some vegans might actually avoid most of these foods. Legumes, which include soy foods. They include beans, peas, which is green peas or split peas, lentils, peanuts. So those are, the, the category of legumes is, is high in lysine. Quinoa is also high in lysine. So is seitan, pistachios, pumpkin seeds, and if you're so inclined, amaranth. Um, so here are my protein recommendations. Two to three servings of lysine foods per day. Hopefully that's not very difficult. Uh, if you're an athlete, you might want to eat more than that, but you will probably naturally do that by just eating more food. If you are older, you should err on the side of eating a few uh, more high protein foods than less because you need the protein. As people age, they, their bodies are less able to assimilate protein and it can lead to uh, deterioration of muscle and bone. So that it is important for older vegans to make sure they're getting enough protein. And I would suggest if you're someone who gets colds very, very frequently, that you might need to get a bit more protein in your diet. That could be the reason. Now here are some vegans who are getting enough protein. They eat it in the winter, so. Uh, okay. Calcium and vegan diets. Calcium is kind of my, I, I was very big on promoting vitamin B12 for about 10 years, and calcium is the other nutrient that I think that our community is somewhat neglecting. So if you see the average intakes of vegan, vegans compared to meat eaters, uh, on average meat eaters get about 1,000 milligrams of calcium per day, and that's what the, the uh, recommended dietary, uh, well, it's not an RDA, it's a dietary reference intake. There's actually not enough information to have an RDA for calcium, but the government recommends you get 1,000 milligrams per day. Lacto-ovo vegetarians get about 800 to 900, and vegans on average get 5 to 600. So are these low intakes a problem? Now during the 90s, and you'll still hear this, uh -oh, are high in calcium, magnesium, potassium, and vitamin K, which are all good for bones. So if you put all this stuff together, then the vegan Vegans getting much lower intakes of calcium shouldn't matter. But what we found out in more recent years is that if you, if you look at this uh, graph, you can see that hip, fr uh, hip fractures in the top graph. Sweden is a, country, a high dairy country. Japan and Hong Kong are, are low dairy intake regions. And there's greater hip fractures. But if you look at the spinal fractures, uh, we find out that Sweden actually has less spinal fractures than these other two areas. And <clears throat> it turns out that the latest theory on this is that hip fractures have a lot more to do with your chance of falling and the shape of your hip bone, and not so much about whether you have osteoporosis, uh, whereas spinal fractures are directly related to osteoporosis. So that currently the theory that, that dairy causes us hip, hip fractures in these other countries is is not considered true. And if you also look at protein and calcium absorption and excretion, you'll find that even though it is true that if you give someone a uh, large amount of animal protein, they will excrete calcium over a period of time after they eat it. But they also increase the calcium absorption from their digestion. This was later found to be the case. So it's, it, it could it's likely to be just a wash. In other words, you absorb more, you don't need it, so you excrete more. Here was a, in 2009, there was an analysis of fracture risk in seven cohort studies uh, looking at protein and bone health. Um, and it's, to my knowledge, still the most thorough analysis, even though it's been six years. Two studies showed that there was an increased risk of fractures with animal protein, one study showed there was an increased risk of total protein, both animal or plant. Two studies showed there was a decreased risk with animal protein. Two studies showed a decreased risk with vegetable or soy protein. There was many 
null findings, even though there were just seven studies, they looked at things in a variety of ways. Most, most, for most things, they didn't find anything at all. And they, the authors, they, they were not from the dairy industry, and I think that that's important that we know who is funding this, the research. They say, overall, the weight of evidence shows the effect of dietary protein on the skeleton appears to be favorable to a small extent, or at least not, is not detrimental. Now, in 2007, which is really what got my attention, was an Epic, Ex uh, Epic Oxford, um, followed 1,000 vegans over five years, as well as 10, about 10,000 lactose vegetarians, and they found that vegans had 30% higher risk of bone fractures than meat eaters. Now, it was adjusted for all these things, including physical activity. Um, however, when they broke the vegans into two groups, those getting 525 milligrams of calcium or more, or those getting less, they found that the vegans getting 525 milligrams or more had the same rates of fractures as meat eaters. It was only 55% of the vegans that were getting that much calcium. However, it was about 95% of the other diagrams, which is no surprise given the, the first slide in the section, which showed that the meat eaters tend to get a lot more calcium. So, they concluded that, uh, at least until we know more, uh, it appears that the, the lo low calcium intakes are a problem. And then, the Venice Tall Study, too, did a, did also did a study after five years of follow-up, uh, where they found that vegans had twice the risk of a fra hip fracture, uh, it was only adjusted for age, so you have to take that with a grain of sugar um, because that's not very much adjusting for a study like this. But it was not great news to see that either. Now, another uh, finding in the Venice Health Study 2 was that people who ate legumes and vegetarian meats, uh, which are high in protein, had a lower risk of fractures. Um, quite a bit lower if you look at the uh, risk, about 70... Uh, 66% lower. All right, so now I'm going to talk about calcium absorption from different plant foods. The, the foods that have a, a number listed are ones that have actually been studied. And um, they determine it through isotopic labeling. You eat the food with calcium that's labeled, and then they figure out how much either you, um, how much ends up ex that you excrete. Um, the ones that just say hi, so, okay, so what decreases calcium absorption from green, leafy greens is the amount of oxalate in the, in the food. Oxalate binds the calcium in your gut and then you don't absorb the calcium. So based on the oxalate content, the other foods can be determined as being good sources of calcium or not. And so, as you can see, uh, spinach, Swiss chard, and beet greens are probably very low in absorption. Spinach has actually been measured. So spinach is a good food to eat, it's just you're not going to get much calcium from it. Even though it's very high. It's extremely high in oxygen. So my calcium recommendations are, um, vegans should try to get at least 700 milligrams. In my opinion, you can, do, you can add some calcium to your diet by uh, it, making sure you eat three servings of greens each day, uh, a serving is a half cup cooked. It's a full cup, uncooked. Uh, there's been all this, the absorption of uh, studies on calcium and leafy greens have been done on cooked uh, leafy greens, so I don't really know what the absorption would be if they're not cooked. An eight ounce glass of fortified soy milk or orange juice or a three to 500 milligram supplement. I'm going to talk about vitamin B12 in plant foods. So, uh, plants don't naturally contain vitamin B12. Uh, they have no requirements for vitamin B12, and they don't produce vitamin B12. Uh, it is produced by some bacteria in, in the feces of mammals, including humans. Uh, so, if you have contaminated fermented foods with a bacteria that produces B12, or contamination of water, you could possibly get B12 producing bacteria in algae or seaweeds. Uh, if insects live in certain water, they might, they might get uh, vitamin B12 from insects as well. Okay, so B12 has many inactive analogs. This is another problem. Uh, inactive analogs can block B12 absorption from the digestive tract and can block its function in the cells. 
So it makes determining the B12 level of a certain plant food not very easy. There were many plant foods 10 years ago that food manufacturers were using the same way that they measure B12 in animal foods. They were applying that to plant foods and saying, oh, we have B12 in our food. But you don't actually know what a food is going to do to your B12 status uh, unless you use the gold standard, which is to measure, to feed the food to people and see if it lowers, <coughs> excuse me, see if it lowers your methylmalonic acid level. And to date, no plant food has lowered MMA levels in published research. It hasn't been tried much. It's been tried on nori. Um, and to my knowledge, I don't know that it's been tried on anything else. So here are foods that are rumored to contain B12. Blue-green algae, seaweeds like moray and chlorella, fermented foods, brewer's yeast, or unfortified nutritional yeast. Nutritional yeast that's been fortified with B12 is a source of vitamin B12. Organic foods, intestinal bacteria. Some people say you don't need B12 because your intestinal bacteria make it. Um, aloe vera I've seen, and some people, one person I know, it reports that bacteria is floating, B12 producing bacteria is floating in the air. And I, I don't mean they're a random person off the street. This is a person who purports himself to be a serious health professional. Um, so don't believe any of that. So B12 deficiency, uh, you, there's two types. One is overt. Uh, you get macrocytic or megaloblastic anemia. That's when your blood cells uh, do not divide right and you get, you get very tired. If you eat enough folate, you could have B12 deficiency and, and not get anemia because the folate can take the place of B12. Um, you can also get neurological damage. It tends to start with tingling in your fingers and toes uh, and it works its way up towards the center of your body. That's generally how you would know. Also, severe fatigue. But there's also, so those are two ways that you, at least the neurological ones, that you know that you could be having a problem. But there's also subclinical B12 deficiency, which is de determined by whether you have an elevated homocysteine level or not. Um, homocysteine is a byproduct of amino, amino acid uh, metabolism, and B12 helps clear it from your system. If you, elevated homocysteine has been linked to dementia and Alzheimer's disease, stroke, low bone mineral density in vegetarians, whoops, okay, those three. Now if you look at vegans who do not supplement with B12, uh, I will just quickly say what this shows. It shows that vegans tend to have lower B12 levels and it shows that vegans have higher homocysteine levels. If you should look at vegans who have, uh, that are supplementing with B12, it shows that our homocysteine levels are ideal. In fact, the 98 study from the USA, you can't get homocysteine levels much lower than that. So, the moral of that story is that all you have to do is take B12 supplements and you're probably going to be better off, actually, than most meat eaters. So I recommend to do one of the following. Fortified foods twice per day. You can only absorb large amounts of B12 at, at one, and it's, um, there's two mechanisms by which you absorb B12. One's called intrinsic factor, and it's when proteins grab the B12 in your digestive system and it shuttles it into your cells. You can, all, you can um, saturate that system fairly quickly. So that's why I recommend fortified foods twice a day. When you eat a fortified food, you're just getting a small amount of B12, so you want to do it more than once a day. Um, from supplements, I recommend 25 to 100 micrograms per day. The RDA is 2.5. So that's quite a bit more than RDA, but it, the, I, I didn't mention the other way to absorb B12. The other way is just passive diffusion, where the B12 is just floating around in your cell junctions open, and it just floats in and eventually gets picked up by a protein. And it happens at about 1% of B12 that you eat, um, or 1,000 micrograms twice a week, which you will. Okay. Vitamin D. It regulates the calcium. Uh, it regulates calcium absorption and excretion, especially when calcium intake is low. That can make it uh, important for vegans because our calcium intakes tend to be low. It is made by the action of UV rays on the skin, but it's not synthesized in, clim in northern climates during the winter because the UV rays aren't strong enough for most people. A vitamin D deficiency causes muscle weakness and bone pain. Oops. So vitamin D levels in Epic Oxford, which is in the UK where there's not much sun, uh, show that vegans have healthy, on average, healthy levels of vitamin D. 
um, were slightly above the normal level. So it was 55 when the normal level is 50 to 125. I come across vegans once in a while who get severe uh, vitamin D deficiency. This happens to meat eaters too. Vegans are not the only ones. Anyone whose skin doesn't make it efficiently or you're not out in the sun much can get it. Uh, some people, especially children, will get it from fortified milk. Uh, cow's milk has vitamin D because it's fortified in the United States. And they started doing that many decades ago to prevent rickets. Um, so there was a study done on vitamin D2 in vegans in 2000. They found that after 11 months, taking vitamin D2 at 200 international units a day increased the lower back bone density in four out of five vegans. Now that is not like four out of five dentists recommend Crest. That was literally four out of five vegans. Uh, there was only five vegans in that study. So, <laughs> it, it, uh, it's, it wasn't many people, but it did indicate one that vitamin D2, because I'm about to talk about D2 versus D3, that vitamin D2 does work for some people, and that these vegans, well, they're in a very northern climate, uh, but they definitely needed more vitamin D. So D2 is vegan. Uh, D3 is usually not vegan, but there are some companies now that are making vitamin D3 that's vegan. VitaShine, also known as Nordic Naturals. In large doses, vitamin D3 uh, stays in the system longer than vitamin D2. And then there's, there has been a lot of research looking at vitamin D2 versus D3 in smaller amounts. 50,000 international units once per week is how vitamin D deficiency is typically treated. Um, and so that's how we know this because they measured people under a typical vitamin D uh, treatment regimen. In, in smaller doses, um, vitamin D3 does slightly better than D2, but D2 seems to be effective enough. And um, if you take vitamin D with fat, it increases the absorption. So if you're taking vitamin D supplements, I recommend you take them with a meal where there's fat, where there's going to be some fat. Um, so my recommendations for vitamin D are 600 international units, well that's the RDA. Usually uh, supplements come in 1,000 international units and that's just, that's even better. Uh, the typical fortified soy milk doesn't have enough to make up for this. So here are your options. If you get this much sun, you have to have the sun at a time where you could get burned. You don't want to get burned, but it has to be possible or else you're probably not making vitamin D. Uh, or a uh, in thousand international units. So I would recommend in Northern California to take that during the winter, a thousand international units. You can buy a whole winter supply for about, for under $10 of vitamin D2. Iodine is needed for healthy thyroid function, which regulates metabolism. It's found in produce in very small amounts, and it depends, it depends on the iodine in the soil. Okay, once, only one study has looked at the status of iodine in vegans, and they found that vegans needed a bit more iodine. Uh, normal, let's see, um, normal is greater than 100 micrograms per liter, and vegans had, on average, a bit less than 100. So it indicated that these vegans should have been getting more iodine. So here are my recommendations for iodine, real quick. The RDA is 150 micrograms. Um, if you don't regularly eat iodized salt or sea vegetables, you should, um, and especially if you regularly eat soy, you should get a um, supplement with iodine. You don't want to take more than the RDA. So iron is somewhat complicated because vegans have as high or high, as high or higher iron intakes than meat eaters. The plant iron is not as well absorbed as iron from meat. Uh, vegan men rarely have iron deficiency. It's not uncommon common for vegan women to have deficiency, but rates are about the, the same as the normal population, at least in the cross-sectional studies that have been done. Vitamin C, however, significantly increases iron absorption. Here are the foods high in vitamin C. You have to be careful. There's some ideas that vitamin C, say, is high, like you could just sprinkle lemon juice on your food. Lemon juice doesn't have enough vitamin C to make a difference. These are the foods that do, and you need to get a full serving of them. Coffee and tea inhibit iron. So if you're prone to anemia, you want to eat vitamin C with your meals, uh, or, or, or these foods high in it, and avoid coffee and tea at meals. 
Okay, and if you do have a problem with uh, anemia, I have an article at veganhealth.org that talks about dealing with that. A vitamin A is one that it's easy to get on a vegan diet as long as you're eating these foods. So I like to point out these foods to make sure that you should be eating them every day. Uh, some combination or of these foods, or if you want for the ones really high, I think that's all you need. The RDA again is 700 for women, 900 RDA for men, and carrot juice you can see is about three times the RDA. Uh, with the other foods, somewhat less. Okay, zinc. Uh, vegans have intakes close to the RDA. Deficiency symptoms of zinc uh, deficiency is poor wound healing, hair loss, impaired immune function, dermatitis, especially cracks around the mouth or other body orifices. Legumes, nuts, seeds, and oatmeal are high in zinc. Uh, but if you have a problem with any of these things, I just recommend taking maybe a 10 milligram supplement per day. Um, one, I just okay, I have two more slides. I think. Um, people are usually interested in soy and breast cancer, so without spending a lot of time on it, the in terms of uh, getting breast cancer, soy intake is associated with a reduced risk, and quite strongly, uh, strong statistically in at least the 2009 Shanghai Women's Study. Um, let me quickly go to the, uh, what the American Cancer Society says about soy. Even though animal studies have shown mixed effects on breast cancer with soy supplements, studies in humans have not shown harm from eating soy foods. Moderate consumption of soy foods appears safe for both breast cancer survivors and the general population and may even lower breast cancer risk. Avoid soy supplements until more is known. Um, so oxalate, I'd like to warn about oxalate because if someone is drinking a lot of green smoothies that are based on spinach, you are going to get a high amount of oxalates. Having a high amount of water is also is going to help counteract it, but if you, if you uh, eat a high amount of oxalate, you can end up with a kidney stone. So just be careful if you're juicing. I would recommend kale instead of spinach, um, and definitely not, and not Swiss chard or rhubarb or beet greens. Uh, so pick other greens, at least most of the time, or most of the spoon. 